Hey there friends, Dave Politis, Can I'm Missing Project, copyrighted edition for a video channel. And yes, this is a missing person segment. And I'm still posting new segments over on Rumble. Missing 411, David Politis presents the factual news. If you put that in your Google spacebar, you will find me. And uh, there's some big things happening in the news right now. And uh, I know you, some of you guys, that's Huck saying hello, folks. Some of you guys don't want to hear it, but just recently, I've got to say it. I've got to say it. Just recently, like within the last four days, another 1,000 Chinese aged military men were stopped at the southern border. All of them were let in. And, uh, about two weeks ago, I was at a restaurant here in town. It's a place that uh, I see Border Patrolmen getting coffee in all the time, and I always talk to them. And uh, they, I always talk to them like a law enforcement guy, like, hey, glad you guys are here, blah, 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 start talking. And I said, so how bad is it on the southern border right now? And they said it's as bad as it's ever been. And then I asked them about... Uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about Iraqis, Iranians, and uh, Chinese age military men, and, and they stopped me and they said, Dave, you're on the right track. We're in trouble. We've got people here right now in our country that need to be removed. It bothers me so much, folks, I can't even tell you. I can barely sleep at night. But we are talking about missing people and uh, got a couple of really interesting cases. This is Missing Truckers Part 4. And I got to tell you, it only gets stranger and stranger. In this case, we're going to talk about a man named Archie Taylor, 52 years old, went missing September 29th, 1960. Columbus, Georgia. He was a 25-year truck driver, considered extremely safety conscious, a family man, didn't drive recklessly, always made his stops, could be depended on, called when he was supposed to call to check in, was your optimum employee. He's married and had one daughter. Well, he left on September 27, 1960, and he was to take a load to Wisconsin. And it was a $14,000 load of cheese. He, it was transported down from Wisconsin to Georgia. He was going to drive it to Florida. Well, his wife stated that Archie that morning was in a great mood. He was kidding around with his teenage daughter. In fact, gave her 50 cents to go out and get something. Well, there was a series of stops he had to make once he carried, got a hold of the cheese. He got it in a refrigerated truck. On October 2nd, police officers found Archie's truck abandoned on a trucking route in Columbus, Alabama. Now, he was headed for Jacksonville. So from where he left his home in Dalton, Georgia, straight shot down to Jacksonville. But when police found the truck, it was on the street, they first contacted Archie's trucking company because it had sat there for a couple days and neighbors had said something. Well, they called the trucking company and they said, well, that's Archie Taylor, one of our most reliable drivers. He's got to be there somewhere. So they searched for him for a couple days. They didn't find him. They called his wife and his wife freaked out. Understandably. They never said what they found in the truck or what they didn't find in the truck or the condition of the truck other than the cheese was all there. Well, the trucking company dispatched a new driver, drove the truck on to Jacksonville and delivered it. On October 12th, Mrs. Taylor had been waiting for word it had been 10 additional days, and she and her teenage daughter decided that what they do is they were going to drive the route that Archie took 
take photos of him, stop at truck stops, restaurants along the way that he might have stopped at to see if they could churn something up because the police weren't coming up with anything. And I gotta tell you that looking back into my police days, I never worked missing persons. I thought it was a dead end job, boring. How wrong I, I learned to be even after retiring and moving on to second and third occupations. Well, missing people investigators have so many cases like this that are just voluntary disappearances. Nothing unusual about them. People just don't want to work anymore, just want to fall out of society. Nothing strange. But every once in a while, something unusual does happen. Well, what what happened here is Mrs. Taylor and the daughter are driving, looking around, and they don't have a whole lot of money, folks. And they just get enough money to make the drive from their house down to where the truck was, walk that area, passed out a bunch of flyers. Nobody had seen Archie. Nobody had heard from him. It's like he just disappeared. Well... The company made a statement to the public that Archie was one of the most reliable guys, etc., etc. Then, October 25th, another eight, another eight, 13 days after the wife and the daughter made the trip, Archie calls home out of the blue. He says that he blacked out while driving has no idea where the truck might be. He says he's now cold, wet, and sick. Well, needless to say, that's a huge shock if you were her. He said that on October 23rd, it's like he all of a sudden woke up. It's like his senses became alive and he remembered who he was. He said he was presently in Montgomery, Alabama, and he'd eventually hitchhike home as soon as he could. He says he does remember being in Mariana, Florida. He doesn't know how he got back to where he is now. And the last thing driving that he remembers is that he was near Griffin, Georgia, and somebody yelled at him to slow down. He says the context he doesn't remember the days he doesn't remember, why the truck is where it is. So let me explain this to you. So Archie's family lived in Dalton, Georgia. Here's Chattanooga. There's the border. Dalton's just south. Well, it's a two hour and 56 hour drive to Columbus. And then Montgomery, where he was at. So the wife and the daughter drive this route. It's about 192 miles, and they're just trying to dig up anything. And then Archie shows up in Montgomery. But then he also says he was in Mariana, too. Well, he eventually gets home. Slowly his memory starts to come back more. The article said that his wife indicated that over the years that they'd been together, which decades, he had had two other bouts similar to this. And she didn't go into a lot of detail, but she did say that he had been a truck driver for 25 years. This happened while driving a truck. Now, it's always interesting to me how the memory comes back at certain times and other times it doesn't. Does it have to heal from some injury? Is something putting a cap on us so we can't remember certain things? I know that other people have gone through reverse hypnosis where they try to get their memory back over a very compromised issue. 
I don't ever recommend this because there's a lot of people out there that claim that they can do this, but they really can't. So I'm very reluctant to ever send anybody to someone like this. Now, there were some real experts back 10, 20 years ago, but they've since passed away. So me recommending that somebody go to someone to have this done, I wouldn't do that right now. Now, one thing that Archie did say after he was back with his family, said he'd never drive a truck again. He says, that's the end of it. He said, this was too tough on the family and on him, and he didn't want to go through it. Amen for that, Archie. All right. Now, from these segments, I hope you're gaining something here. And what I mean by that, I'll use missing 411 hunters as the example. I've got tons and tons of stories in the biggest book I wrote about hunters going out together and separating to hunt different areas. And when that separation happens, things happen to some one of these people. Now, I theorize that the person was alone when this happened. And whatever is doing this is waiting for them to be alone to take them or do something. Now, truck drivers, predominantly, it's a lonely job. They're alone in the cab of their truck. Now, there's a lot of couples that drive trucks. So maybe it's not happening to the couples, and maybe it's still happening to the loan drivers. In a future segment, I'm going to talk to you about a very recent case of a truck driver that disappeared under these circumstances. And I'm waiting for that case to evolve and for more things to kind of float up front. I don't like to talk about cases right away because if I do, then maybe the person will be found and go, yeah, I just want to run away from that crazy wife of mine. I don't know. So let's just hold off. But there's a lot more of these weird stories. Next one. All the stories I've talked to you about involve truckers. A lot of them involve truck stops. Nathaniel House, 61 years old, disappeared September 5th, 1955. He was married, had a daughter and a son, and he resided in Kingsville, Louisiana. September 16th, 1955. Five miles west of Deming, New Mexico, a man named Jimmy Jackson is driving down the highway. And he sees this sorry looking soul walking on the shoulder of the road and he pulls over. Now, you know, when I say do a good thing for somebody, be nice, extend yourself. Jimmy Jackson had a habit of doing these kind of things, helping people in need. He was a good soul. We well, pulled over and Jimmy was a truck stop manager in Deming. He was on his way to work and he sees this old man, pulls over. This man said his name, or he said his name was FJ. And Nate said, or uh, <coughs> Jimmy said he looked wet, cold, and hungry. And they had a conversation. Jimmy asked him where he lived. He said, I don't have a home. And he says, well, do you want to come get a good meal? And he said, yeah. He goes, are you willing to work? The man said, yeah. So he put him in his car and he drove him to Deming to his work. Turns out they needed a dishwasher at the cafe. And they put FJ to work. Right away, he was considered to be a gentle, kind, polite old man. He was 61 years old. They ended up looking, he had, a, he had a coat, and inside the coat it said F.J. Laughlin. So they called him Pops Laughlin. A 
Well, first of all, <laughs> out in the middle of nowhere, New Mexico, you're walking down a highway. It reminds me of a sci-fi movie. How did he get there? So, I'll show you this, because I think it's interesting. You may not, but this is El Paso, Texas. This is Deming, New Mexico. There's nothing out there five miles west. But I just wanted to circle Roswell, because that's probably the number one thing that New Mexico is known for. I think it's strange. I think it's strange. Now, as Pops Laughlin is washing dishes in Deming, New Mexico, Pops's real name is Nathaniel House. 61 years. He went missing from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He had recently retired. He was a laundry services owner and ran a big operation. He ran trucks around this southern part of the U.S. delivering laundry goods and laundry for big services. He retired and one day he just disappeared. He was married, had a wife and kids. Big, big search, nothing really happened. He was one of those missing people that everybody thought, well, he's old, maybe he's senile. There was no evidence he was senile. And no one thought much about it. But <laughs> Nathaniel had a lot of friends. People liked him. His truck drivers loved him. How he arrived in New Mexico is anyone's guess. But he disappeared in September 1955. January 24th, 1956. This has got to be one in a million. A driver for Mr. House's old company, he sold it to somebody else, but the drivers all were still employed. A driver for that laundry service is at that truck stop where Mr. House is now employed as a dishwasher. And he's eating dinner and he looks up and he can't believe what he sees. Now he knew Nathaniel House, everyone called him Nate. He knew Nate really well. He knew Nate had been missing for months. And he knew the family loved him immensely and was having a horrible time trying to deal with it. And he can't believe what's in front of him. It's Nate. He's 100% positive. So he immediately gets on the phone and he calls Nate's family in Louisiana. And he says, you will not believe this. Well, initially, they didn't believe him. He says, no, I'm 100% positive. Well, they know the driver, too, and they said, if he says it is, it must be, but they can't believe it. They figure he's long dead somewhere. So they said, okay, you got to call the police, and you got to tell the police that something's wrong here. So they called Deming police, who called the state police, who figure out that there is a man named Nathaniel House that's reported missing from Louisiana. But you got to remember, folks, this is 1955. Uh, they didn't have communications as quick as they do today. They didn't have photos that could teletype back and forth radically fast, put them on a phone. They didn't have any of that. So the police get there, Deming police and New Mexico State Police, and they start talking to Pops with this truck driver sitting 50 feet away. And they become pretty well convinced that the truck driver might be right because Pops doesn't know really who he is, where he's from, where he's going, nothing. So then they call the family. And the family says, yeah, well, he has this scar and this and that. And they look and he's got those scars. Well, the state police and Deming police decide that they've got to hold Pops or Nathaniel in, in custody until they figure out via social services who he really is. And in the meantime, 
The family says, we're coming there right now. We're leaving, we'll drive nonstop. So the Jackson family, who now have come back from their weekend, see that the guy that they've been helping for months is now in custody. They're devastated. They all said that Pops Laughlin was like the nicest grandpa, polite man they had ever met. And he had become like a family member to Jimmy Jackson and his family. And they were devastated. They couldn't believe that the police took him. That's all they knew. Like they're, they're expecting to hear he committed some crime, but Jackson gets to the police department and gets told this story. You can't believe it. He's really, really sad because this means that Pops Laughlin is going to leave. That's how much they love this guy. The next day, well actually, a day and a half later, driving nonstop, the family gets Nathaniel's family. And they have the face-to-face -face meeting. And the family states that Nate just blankly stared at the son, the daughter, and his wife. Didn't recognize any of them. They said it was very sad. Their hearts sunk. They got tears in their eyes. But they said that they love, love Nate. And that they were going to bring him back with them. And... Social services granted that, said for sure. On the way back in the car, and once they got to their residence in Louisiana, they said Nate slept nonstop for two days. Now my question is, is that the mind healing? Is he around people that he knows love him? What kind of trauma happened here? Obviously, Jimmy Jackson and his family treated him like gold. And how lucky was Nathaniel to be found by a family like that? Now, my mind goes really weird here. But it's pretty obvious Nathaniel was a good soul. Karma. If you believe that Nathaniel was taken and then released... Do these powers to be have the ability to look down on our world and see a car coming down the road and go, hey, that car's a good, got a good soul in it. We've got a good soul with us. Let's put him right in front of that car so he can get picked up. I don't know. I'm thinking outside the box here. This whole thing is very confusing to me. The question that came up to me is, how did Nate get from Louisiana to a lonely highway five miles west of Deming, New Mexico. That's the oddest of locations to go back and forth from. When Jimmy Jackson and Nate's family described Nate, he was described as almost defenseless, meaning he wasn't aggressive, he wasn't angry, he wasn't loud, he was kind, loving soul. The question also comes up is how long was Nate walking on that highway? That's what I really wonder. Now once Nate got home, his family said that he started to get <coughs> memory back of being robbed of his wallet in El Paso, Texas. He said that he couldn't put a timeline on it or a date, but he just remembered that. Now, you say, well, Dave, this didn't involve a trucker. It involved everything but a trucker. And here's why it's here. First of all, He's employed at a truck stop when he's found. How weird is that? Number two, he owned a company that had a trucking crew. Number three, he's found by a trucker. Number four, 
he's found on a lonely stretch of highway outside of Denver, New Mexico. Where's he walking from on that highway? And where's he walking to? It's the part that my mind just goes, wow. Somebody made a comment the other day on one of my videos. Oh, Politis has lost it. He, he has no idea what he's doing now. He's grasping at straws. I don't think so. I'm sorry. I don't think so. We're talking about missing people still. Nate was missing. And this part of amnesia plays a critical role. Why does somebody get amnesia? It could be a medical reason, physical injury, but there are cases where amnesia, where somebody is victimized to a point that their mind cannot handle acknowledging it. There's also cases of amnesia where supposedly some beings have the ability to wipe our mind clean for a certain period of time. Now, maybe some of these beings aren't so good at wiping the mind, rather than just wiping the mind of what happened to them when they were in their presence, maybe they wipe it a little too clean and it takes a good portion of their life with it. I don't know. I do know that it's very perplexing. And as we get to the next couple of videos, you're gonna see that it becomes a little more clear what's really happening. And I'm walking you down this road, just like Nate was walking down the road. I'm walking you down this road of knowledge. In Missing 411 Hunters, there are so many cases that are the same. And the comment I get from that book is, Dave, at the beginning, I read the book for the first 20 pages and I thought, oh, these are just a bunch of idiots and they get lost out there and it's just happenstance. Halfway through the book, you had my attention, Dave. Three quarters of the way through the book, Dave, I was riveted. And Dave, when I read the last page, I wanted more. It's so blatantly obvious, Dave, that something super unusual is happening here. The paradigm. If I give you this a little blurps as we go along, your mind will try to analyze it away. Oh, you know, this guy didn't love his wife. He was just on the run for a few days to have fun. But if I inundate you with so many cases that you start to say, this, this can't be people just running away from their problems. There's gotta be something here. And when the multitude of these cases, the victims have seen a doctor and the doctors are perplexed as well. That's gotta give you some thought here that we're dealing with something really unusual. Somebody said something the other day where, Dave, maybe there's, there's a big difference between the people that come back and are alive that don't have a memory, I'm talking about hikers, whatever, and the people that come back and are dead. Maybe the people that come back and are dead fought whatever the issue is, didn't want to live, didn't want to work with them, and maybe tried to kill one of them, I don't know. And they, these over here, placid, go along with it, yeah, whatever you want to do, and, and they get dumped back into the world. Or maybe the ones over here have that memory that can handle it, and these over here don't. Thinking outside the box, folks, we've got to start thinking outside the box on this because conventional thinking isn't going to solve this. So, those are the two cases for today. I appreciate you being here. And remember, we're still, I'm still signing posters every day. Come into our store at NA, like North America Bigfoot Search.com. Posters, DVDs, books. And uh, remember, we have over 625 videos right here.
on this channel that I wish you would watch because if you watch them, it helps us greatly. Just not you, not watching new, new ones. Older ones helps us the same as if you're watching a new one. And gee, I have so many videos out there I could keep you busy for half year, half the year. All right? So, do something kind for somebody. Just like Mr. Jackson did driving down the highway for Nate. Act of kindness. Polite us out.